see some familiar faces, some perhaps not so familiar, but it's just a joy to be with you. Uh, in the past 15 years or so, as uh, Neil mentioned, I, I have gotten around a little bit. Uh, best I could count, I've preached in 144 dioceses, mostly in the United States and Canada, but in several other countries as well. Uh, I've preached at the invitation of cardinals and archbishops and major religious superiors, notably Mother Teresa of Calcutta, often asked me to preach retreats for her sisters. Uh, I've traveled one and a half million miles in the last 10 years by air. That doesn't count cars, buses, trains, and so forth. And the whole point of it all is that in that period of time, I've seen some of the church. I think I can honestly say I've seen a pretty good cross-section of the church. And as often happens with a person who has been married for 15 years, I've been ordained for 15 years, same thing. <laughs> I can tell you that uh, my love for my bride, the church, is different today than it was 15 years ago. I still love the church, to be sure. But I think as time goes on, married people know this, um, your love matures, deepens. Um, I don't have perhaps the romanticized notion today of what it means to be a priest. I'm perhaps not quite as idealistic in, a, in certain ways as I was in the beginning. Hopefully I'm more mature. But in that period of time, that 15 or so years, I've seen a lot in the church. And as I've grown older with my bride, I've grown ornerier <laughs> with my bride. I'm almost 60 years old. I have no time for playing silly games, engaging in political correctness, or pitter-pattering around. Those of you who know me know that I have never been accused of being subtle. I remember the words of Jesus who said, say yes when you mean yes and no when you mean no. All else is from the evil one. That's what Jesus said. So I'm going to tell you one of my impressions of the church in the last 15, 20 years. We have a crisis of leadership. We have a crisis of leadership, both in the church and in the world. And that crisis could prove fatal in more than one way. The, the worst way is spiritually. It's one thing to lose your life physically in a war in Iraq or Afghanistan. It's another thing to undergo what St. Paul calls that second death, the loss of the soul. Now that's the only real tragedy in human existence. The only definitive loss in human existence, John Paul the Great said, is the loss of eternal salvation. That's the bottom line. All the rest of it is nonsense. As St. Paul said, I count all else rubbish compared to the surpassing knowledge of my Lord Jesus Christ. So one of the most distressing realities I've encountered in the past 20 years or so, yes, it's a, that crisis of leadership, which is so essential. Now, in my lifetime, I've been very fortunate. 
I've had the opportunity to operate in many different spheres of influence. Athletics, university setting, the military, the corporate world, and indeed now the church. And I can tell you something that I've discovered after a lot of experience. The principles for winning are the same. Whether you're a CEO, an NCO, or a bishop, or a mom, or a dad, or a religious, or a priest, the principles for winning are the same, and the principles for good leadership are the same. Now let me summarize this talk for you very concisely. The greatest leader who ever lived, the greatest hero who ever lived, is Jesus Christ, period, exclamation point. Other great leaders were those who followed him, the saints. Now you can't be too educated or too sophisticated to make a statement like that, because the day you become too sophisticated or too educated to make a, a statement like that, you're in trouble. So once again, the greatest leader who ever lived, Jesus Christ, those who followed him most closely, the saints, great leaders. So let's, let's look at this question of leadership a little bit. I have had uh, oh, some, a relationship with a certain uh, branch of the United States Army for some time, actually since 1967 when I enlisted in the Army, but most recently, the last couple of years, I've renewed that association with the United States Army Special Forces. Now the Army knows something about leadership and one thing that we should not be ashamed to do wherever we operate is try to learn from other spheres of influence. If I'm in the corporate world I shouldn't be too proud to learn something from the military. If I'm in the church I shouldn't be too proud to learn something from whatever source. I can derive it from. Now, the Army knows something about leadership. By their fruits, you will know them, Jesus said. Big crisis today in the church and in the world. We have a tendency to confuse management with leadership. Management is not leadership. Now management can be a tool of leadership. Management is not leadership and if you reduce leadership to management you have doomed yourself to absolute mediocrity. We are at war. And I don't mean in Iraq and Afghanistan, bad as that is. Just like St. Paul said, we are at war. But our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the world rulers. In this present age of darkness, the spiritual host of wickedness, in regions above, we are at war. And the spoils of victory are the souls of God's children, bought with a price, the blood of God, the blood of God. Jesus is God. You may think that an odd saying. It is theologically 100% correct. Our salvation purchased with the blood of God. In this battle, which is fierce, it is highly unlikely that in a knockdown, drag out, bare knuckles brawl, it is highly unlikely that in a, a, an assault on a heavily fortified position that anyone's going to follow a clerk. 
highly unlikely that anybody's going to follow a clerk in a frontal assault on the gates of hell. They're not going to follow a manager or an administrator or a technician. They'll follow a leader, and they won't follow anything less than a leader. I mean, if we are not about the business of creating leaders in the church, Catholic universities, government, then we are wasting our time. There are certain elements of leadership that are consistent, whether you're in the corporate world, the military, the athletic world, the church. There are elements of leadership that are quite consistent. Listen, if you learn principles, you can solve problems. Uh, it's like the old adage, you know, if, if, you, if you give a man a fish, you can feed him for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, he can feed himself for a lifetime. Principles. I'm going to give you ten elements, ten principles for leadership. Over a hundred year period, the United States Army developed these. I first came in contact with these when I was seven years old. I'll tell you about that a little bit later. Leadership. Ten letters in the word. L, lead. If you're a leader, then by golly, lead. In order to lead, you better have a spine, a backbone. You better have some substance to your character, some moral wherewithal, and you better lead by example. Because if you don't lead by example, ultimately no one will follow you. When Jesus Christ said, you must take up your cross daily and follow me, he didn't fail to take up his cross. He went first. There's a story from World War II of a high-ranking general going to the front at one of the invasions when Normandy was going on and he wasn't quite sure exactly what unit he had walked into and they had to undertake an assault on a very heavily fortified position on, on a height of land, machine gun fire. And he said, what unit is this? I forgot the number but I was like, uh, 90th Rangers, sir. All right, Rangers, lead the way. And there came the motto of the United States Army, Rangers. Rangers lead the way. Leadership. You go first. Don't ever be, ask anybody else to do what you wouldn't do, whether you're a dad or a mom, religious superior, pastor, whatever it is. Leadership. First letter in the word, L, lead by example. I, I can't help when I say that, I can't help but think of our own founder, Father Jim Flanagan, who many of you know. He's always done that. He's always exemplified that. What an example. I never heard the man say no. And he'd never ask you to do anything he himself hasn't done a thousand times. Lead. By example. E. Second letter of the word, leadership. E. Educate. Educate. What a magnificent, noble, beautiful reality, education. I was once asked, to give a short address at an occasion in a Catholic diocese on the West Coast, they, they, was, they had a new high school. Now, I had just gone to that diocese to help this bishop. It was a very liberal diocese. 
And I didn't know it, but it wasn't a person in an official capacity who came up to me and said, Father, we want you to give an address um, of about 10 minutes on Catholic education. It was some disgruntled layperson <laughs> who, want, who wanted me to say something quite opposed to what the other side was standing for. So somehow I got introduced and I went, okay, Catholic education. Number one, it ought to be Catholic. And that is not an irrelevant statement. The year before he died, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, the most respected archbishop in North America, maybe the world, certainly one of them, late 60s, before he died, he said, I tell my best friends and my relatives, if you want your children to fight for their faith, send them to public school. If you want them to lose their faith, send them to Catholic school. <laughs> Archbishop Fulton Sheen. Now why would he make such a horrible statement? Because there was a certain reality at work. Under the specious pretext of Catholic, they were subverting the doctrine of the faith. I've run into it a million times. Children that have been through 12 years of Catholic education, they can't say a Hail Mary. Many places in this country, now not here, you're lucky. You're very, not lucky, you're blessed in Corpus Christi. You've always had, you've had good bishops who've been true leaders. You've had good priests. And, and you're way ahead of many other places. I've gone to places where you, were, you couldn't be sure what religion you'd just walked into. <laughs> I have often said that one of the tactics in battle is to take the high ground. And the high ground is education and Satan took it. And Catholic universities and seminaries and even grammar schools were subverted was an authentic education. What is education? Uh, education's a journey. What kind of a journey? A journey into the truth. Education is a journey into the truth. And if you are going further and further and further away from the truth, ultimately the truth who's God, then you're not educated. You've been educated into imbecility in plain English. That's not education. That's the lack of education. That's the subversion of education. And so, if you're a leader, you've got to educate your people. You know, if, if you're a mom and dad, and you certainly are leaders, mom and dad, you've got to educate your children. By golly, if I were a parent and God didn't trust me enough, to, you know, that I could be one. He said, well, we'll let you be a priest. That's a being a parent's too big a job for you. And it is. But I'll tell you this. I would know what they were putting in my kid's head. And God help them if it was garbage. And if I sent them to a Catholic school, and I was in this diocese on the west coast at the right hand of the bishop. And when, they, when the bishop put me in there, he said, look, what I'm doing is I'm giving you my job. I said, what do you mean, bishop? He said, I spend 90% of my time filling out depositions and in in interrogatories and testifying in court. Uh, everything from somebody slipped on the, uh, on the sidewalk in the snow to sex abuse cases. My job, I'm the bishop. I'm the teacher. I'm the apostle, but I don't have time. They've got me tied up, so you have to do it. Teach my diocese. And that's how the, my series on the catechism of the Catholic Church began. The bishop said, teach the catechism. And so I took the catechism, and I condensed it into 48 one-hour lectures, 
And we presented it. And, and I, you can't believe the opposition we have. Death threats. A guy with a gun showed up at my place one night, 3 o'clock in the morning. And of course, I have great faith being Catholic, having grown up in that golden age of Catholicism where we believed in our guardian angels and so forth. But I have great confidence in my guardian angel. He's hunting me through a lot. And so I said a quick prayer to my guardian angel, and the guy had a, a rifle, and he was coming up the front steps. And so I prayed to my guardian angel. And then I picked up the 45 off the table. <laughs> and I fired two right through the door over his head. The sheriff got him. Being holy doesn't mean being stupid. <laughs> Leadership, educate. By golly, if I sent my kid to a Catholic school and one of the kids asked a question, why won't the Pope ordain women? And the response was because he's a male chauvinist pig. Do you know how high I'd hang that teacher? Real high. They wouldn't survive. They'd never teach again. Not in that diocese. Educate. And that means in the fullness of truth. Not a diminished sense of the truth. Not a watered down sense of the truth. The authentic and full truth. Who is Jesus Christ? Educate. Attitude, A. Eh? Attitude. Attitude is one of the essential elements of leadership. Oh, your attitude better be right, or you're not going to win. I remember my high school football coach and some other coaches I had too. Attitude, oh, they were big on attitude. Winning is not everything. It's the only thing. That was my coach. And you better do everything possible to win. We are fat and lazy in general and in the church in particular. We, we, we do all kind of things to get a new job, a bigger house, a bigger car. But, but when, that, when the prize is heaven, we're lazy. God calls us to be saints. What is our attitude? I can't do that. You know, I, I, I'm too weak. You bet you are, and so am I. It is in weakness that God's mighty power is brought to perfection. It is when I am weak that I am strong, St. Paul says. <laughs> don't, don't let that be your, your cop out. Oh, I'm weak. I can't do it. I'm not smart enough. Me neither. Man, 25 years ago, I was sitting in a gutter in Los Angeles, drug addicted and homeless. And the devil was laughing. Attitude. Your attitude better be fierce. I refuse to be defeated, Satan. I refuse to give in to the powers of darkness. I refuse. Oh, I don't have any money. I can't do it. Get some. <laughs> Man, 15 years ago, I didn't have enough money to make a couple of audio cassettes. When I gave a talk, so they said, oh, we like to have a cassette of that, Father. I couldn't do it. attitude. My father has all the money in the universe. Money is not a problem. Attitude. Oh, but we are outnumbered by the forces of evil. How can I compete with things like, oh, some of the, some, uh, you know, MTV. How can I compete 
for the souls of teenagers, you know, with MTV or that kind of stuff. You know, you feel kind of outgunned sometimes. I, I, I have spoken to bishops and cardinals, and I've also spoken to high school classes, and I assure you the more intimidating of the two is the high school class. And I, I've, I've had to, oh, I, what am I going to say to them, man? They're not going to, what do I do? I just go and do the same thing I do every place else. Blow the walls off. <laughs> yeah, and, they, and you know what? They come right to it. Don't, don't think if you're in youth ministry, you've got to be engaged with basketball or something. How, try perpetual adoration or something like that. Some, don't, don't insult kids by trivializing youth ministry. One, one of the ways to not be successful in youth ministry is to do a bunch of baloney. They can go to the YMCA for that. You know, they want to play basketball or something. Nothing wrong with those things. Those are good things. Don't do that. Teach them their faith. Give them the Eucharist, the Blessed Mother. See, they're not getting that anyplace else, usually. You give them that, they'll eat it up. Attitude. Man, Oh, I am unbeatable. I am King Kong. And you're not going to whip me, devil. You want to mess with me? My mama wears combat boots. <laughs> God is my father. Attitude. D, discipline. Fourth letter, word leadership. Discipline. You must have discipline or you will fail. You must be a disciplined human being or you will fail miserably in anything. You won't ever be a great athlete. You won't ever accomplish anything in the military or the corporate world. You won't get anywhere in the church either. On the road to salvation, discipline, you've got to have it. When I enlisted in the Army in 1967, I was very undisciplined. I was about to go to jail. I was a kid about to explode, you know, 17 years old, almost 18. I, I, that's a position a lot of people have been in, in in the course of life. Believe me, in the old days when the draft was a reality, it wasn't entirely a negative thing. And I assure you there are millions of people like me who could attest to that. Uh, it, it gets to the point sometimes where a young uh, a boy like that, you know, he's going to jail or to Smokey the Bear, the drill instructor. And I'll tell you what, discipline has saved many a human being. Now, sometimes the discipline has to be enforced. Is it the best way? No. But that's kind of like the, with, with, with our love for God. You know, we should come to God out of love, right? We know that. The highest motivation is love. It's like with contrition. Perfect contrition is to be sorry for your sins out of love for God. But a lot of people, they can't muster perfect contrition. So imperfect contrition is, well, you're sorry for your sins because of fear of hell. Now, that's not perfect, but it's a good place to start. <laughs> you can't muster real love, then the fear isn't bad. Well, discipline, by golly, we have an undisciplined generation today. And I don't just mean, I'm not talking about young people. I'm talking about the young people's parents very often. The schools don't have any discipline. I remember being on an airplane, seeing a, a documentary movie on the airplane. It was about a, a black man. I don't remember his name. I should. Uh, he, he was an um, extraordinary man. They put him into the worst school in this big inner city. No one, oh, oh, no one graduated from that school. It was horrible. Terrible. So they put him in there, and he immediately put in strict military discipline. You will refer to me as sir. It's yes, sir, and no, sir. And I will call you Mr. So-and-so. I will respect you until you give me a reason not to respect you. Oh, boy, he enforced it. He was tough as now. I'll tell you what. They started graduating from high school. They went on to college, many of them. He was enormously successful. 
But of course, the powers of be couldn't abide that, and they got rid of him. And then he went into a kind of a correctional facility for juvenile offenders. He did the same thing there. And you know, he was tough. They, they, sometimes, as often happens in those kind of places, somebody beat somebody else up. He put him in a straitjacket. And he'd make the other guy feed him. <laughs> oh, cruel and unusual punishment, they said. You can't do that. Then they went around. The, 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 this was a news group, like a television network, and they interviewed the inmates. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, Mr. Sona. Oh, yes, he saved my life. Yeah, but he put you in a straitjacket. He saved my life. He taught me discipline. If you are not a disciplined person, you can't make it. You will, be, you will never, never achieve anything. Let me tell you one of the biggest reasons for failure in everything, including the spiritual life. People never learn how to do things they don't like. Oh, I don't like to do that. And then they don't. Oh, I can't do that. And then they don't. Well, I remember they, I, the, the society sent me over to Spain to study for a doctorate. And I remember after a couple months, I was miserable. I was over there. I didn't speak Spanish, man. They sent me over there to study on a doctoral level, and I didn't speak Spanish, and all the classes are in Spanish. <laughs> I didn't know the culture. I didn't know the language. And I called up Father Flanagan one night. And I said, Father, I don't think I'm called to this. <laughs> and he said, oh. I said, no, I, I, you know, I just don't fit in here. I'm not called to this. Um, I think maybe I should come home. And he said, oh. I, he said, well, look, refresh my memory. What did I send you over there for? I said, well, I'm supposed to study and get a doctorate degree in theology. He said, ah, theology, yeah. He said, what, what, you have to write a, a, a thesis to do that, right? I said, yes, Father. He said, what's your thesis? I said, it's, it's about the meaning of suffering. <laughs> and there was a long pause at the other end. <laughs> and he said, you get the point? I said, yes, Father. Click. <laughs> you got to learn how to do things you don't like. That discipline. Yeah. I don't like doing a thousand different things. I order myself to do them. I don't like to do them. Don't go by emotions. Go by the intellect. Your intellect orders the rest of you what to do. Oh, but I don't like getting up four o'clock in the morning to go to adoration or early in the morning in the winter to go to mass or what. I don't like it either. I do it. I, I don't like get. I hate airplanes. I don't like airport security. You know, Friday morning comes, I gotta travel, you know, another airplane, man, I got three dogs and they're highly intelligent. I don't spoil my dogs, see, I'm old school. So about three o'clock in the morning when I wake up, I turn the light on and all the dogs from their respective places on my bed they look at me, and they know. See, they say, oh, man, he's going away again. No pork chop. Man, no warm bed. We're going to sleep on concrete. He's going to preach, and we're doing penance. I don't like doing it. I don't like leaving home. I order myself to do it. You know, I did a lot of things when I was in the military, in the corporate world, when I, when I was in seminary, in the university, in a foreign country, now in my life, traveling around, I don't like, there's a lots of things I don't like, and I bet there's a lot of things you don't like too. You've got to train yourself to do it. Discipline. E, a leader empowers his people. Your children, mom, dad, you know, your people in the, in the parish, the, the religious, if you're religious superior. If I say, if I, remember what the Lord Jesus said? He said, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Jesus said that. Can you imagine that? He said, you, we, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. 
That's what he said. He gave an order. That's a leader giving an order. Boy, that's a, that's a pretty tall order. But you know what? He gave us the means to accomplish the goal. He empowered us. What's the empowerment? It's called grace. Grace. Jesus said, you must go out and make disciples of all nations. You must take up your cross every day and follow me. And then he empowered us to do it. Grace. Don't, don't be living dead in sin and complaining about what you can't do. First thing you got to do is get in a state of grace and stay there. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. He is the vine, we are the branches. Without him we can do nothing. But with him, we can do anything. I can scale any wall. I can knock down any stronghold. If the devil be arrayed in front of me, behind me, to the left and to the right, I can be victorious. I'll mow him down in Jesus Christ. That's the way it is. That's reality. Leadership. Empower your people. If they're in a university, a college, classroom, parish, whatever it is, religious congregation, empower your people. You know, like, oh, well, you've got to be saints. That's right. Well, empower them. How do you do that? Be a conduit of grace. You yourself must be the living presence of Jesus Christ for those who are subordinate to you, your, your, your children, your workers, whatever, the religious that God's given you to take care of, people in your parish, whatever it may be. You become pure. You become cleansed. And, and by the way, one of the ways to do that, that, that that's coming, but, but God will empty you out. That's called kenosis. Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself. Kenosis, an emptying. You see, you can't be filled up unless you're first emptied out, and that hurts. And most people will not go through the pain. Hence, they will not get anywhere in the spiritual life. Empower those entrusted to your care. R, receive and respect input. Be open, you know, listen. No one of us has all wisdom. Listen, you know, if you're a bishop, listen to your priests and to your people, religious superior, mom, dad, listen. Hey, th those kids are pretty smart. You you'd be amazed at how astute they are. Now, by the way, Receive and respect info. Yes, receive it. Respect don't mean you have to take it. You may say no from time to time. You're the boss. Act like one. Listen, if Moses had operated by way of consensus, the chosen people would still be wandering in the desert. <laughs> so if you're a leader, indeed, listen, receive, respect input, but, you know, you make the decisions in the final analysis. S. Here's a big one. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. No pain, no gain. No cross, no crown. No goal, no glory. No great victory was ever accomplished except through a heck of a fight. Nobody ever got the Congressional Medal of Honor without having gone through Fierce battle. Sacrifice. And I don't care what your state in life, that's what you're going to have to do. Sacrifice. The cross. I did my doctoral thesis, indeed, on Pope John Paul II's teaching on suffering. The theology of the cross. That's at the heart of our faith. And it really is the operative principle in everything we do. If you're going to win, you know, if you're going to be a successful businessman, athlete, military person, you know about sacrifice. You, you're going to be successful in a marriage, you better find out about sacrifice in a hurry. Because if there's no sacrifice, you're dead meat. Really. 
You know, in the old days, remember how we read in the lives of the saints, some of the saints used to wear a hair shirt to do penance, right? It was a, a itchy a horse hair shirt, and it was all itchy, and they would do penance like that. Don't have to wear a hair shirt anymore, good news. You don't have to wear a hair shirt no more because, it, you know, your hair shirt could be sitting next to you. <laughs> you might be married to your hair shirt. Oh, yeah. Oh, every one of us is a hair shirt to somebody else at one time or another. Oh, yeah. You know, some people rub you the wrong way. Sacrifice, you know. You, Jesus Christ was many things, priest, prophet, and king. But most of all, he was a savior. That's why he came. You know, if you ask the theological question, uh, why did the Word become flesh and dwell among us? Why did Jesus assume a human nature? The answer is redemption. Redemption. So he was many things, but more than all things, he was a Savior. How did he do that? On a cross. Sacrifice. No pain, no gain. Mom, dad, pastor, CEO. Mother Superior, no pain, no gain. Sacrifice, an essential element of leadership. You're not willing to sacrifice, you can't be a leader. H, humility. Now there's a big one. One of the most popular talks I ever did in the last 15 years is on humility. Literally millions of copies of that have gone all over the world. Humility. Oh, I, I could talk a long time. I don't have a long time, but I could talk a long time about that one. Humility, pride. This is the battle. In the beginning, in the garden. How did sin enter the universe? Pride. You can be like gods. The serpent said to Eve, you can be like gods, knowing good and evil. In other words, you can decide subjectively and arbitrarily what is good and evil without any reference to God. You can be like gods, the inducement to pride. So, so how did evil enter the universe? Pride, which resulted in disobedience, which resulted in death. How was, how was that offset then? Humility. The humble handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Humility, which resulted in obedience, which resulted in life. That's the new Eve. That's much of what we celebrated today in the Immaculate Conception. Humility. What is it, though? Now, I don't know how many people are here. 700, somebody said. If I, and I know most of you all good Catholics, and I know you know your faith pretty well. But if I ask you, what's humility? Some of you might get it, some of you wouldn't. I'll give you a good short answer. If I say, what is humility? You say, the acknowledgement of truth. I give you an A+. Plus. What does that mean, though? The acknowledgement of who God is and the acknowledgement of who I am. God is everything. God is everything. He's the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the all-seeing, the all-merciful. That's God. Me, I'm a creature. A little speck in the cosmos. God loves the speck. That's the truth, the acknowledgement of truth. That's humility. Humility isn't walking around saying, I'm no good, I'm no good. You may well be no good. <laughs> but, but that's not what it is. That's not humility. Humility is the acknowledgement of the truth. I have gifts. How'd you get them? God gave them to me. No merit of mine. You have gifts. How'd you get them? God gave them to me. May you be praised forever. You see, that's the acknowledgement of truth. That's authentic humility. And you've got to have humility to be a leader or just, you know, go do something else. You're not going to be a leader without humility. It'll just eat you up and spit you out. You've got to have humility to be a true leader. I, 
initiative, carpe diem, seize the day, seize the day. Initiative, don't sit around on your lazy fat backside waiting for somebody else to do it. Get up and get it done. Initiative, man. I mean it, initiative. There isn't a person in this room who isn't capable of greatness, absolute greatness. We are created for greatness. You and I are created in the image and likeness of God. Now, you know that. That's basic. Says it in the Bible. You know that. We are created in the image and likeness of God. Now, how great is that? That's pretty doggone great. I am created for great. You are a prince or a princess of light. Your father is God. Your mother is the mother of God. The angels surround you. You become one with Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. Incredible. Incredible. And so you are fully capable of initiative. Take initiative. You have a problem, solve the problem. You are faced with a battle, fight the battle. Initiative. You got to exercise initiative to be a leader. And P, plan, prepare, and practice. You, you're never going to achieve any greatness unless you plan and prepare and practice over and over and over again. And all the time people say to me, oh, Father, I just, I came into the church, you know, Oh, I, 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 I'm learning my faith and I'm receiving the sacrament, but oh, I fell on my face. I committed a sin. Woe is me. I am not cut out for this. Man, that, about that time, that, that's about when I take on the appearance of, of, of when I was 18 years old in the Army, Smokey the Bear. And Smokey the Bear talked about breaking his big toe off someplace. And that's about how I feel at that point. Oh, so you fell on your little butt, did you? Oh, poor thing. You committed a sin, did you, after, after, after coming to the church? So what? Get up, man. Get up and go on. It, it, listen. As the years have gone on, I've had an increasing number of priests get in contact with me. Sometimes priests that had problems. Hey, priests are human beings. You know that. All human beings are sinners. Even priests can fall on their face. Oh, I, and, and, and they're very distraught. And sure, it's worse when a if a priest, you know, if a priest commits a sin like these scandals we saw, you know, horrible. When they come and, oh, I did this or I did that, and they can't live with themselves. And they're moaning and they're groaning. And, you know, I can't do it, but like in the old days, man, in the army, the, the, the sergeant wanted to grab you up by your skinny little narrow neck and slap you silly. Be a man! It is not a disgrace to be wounded in battle. It is only a disgrace to desert in battle. So the enemy wounded you. You fell right on your face hard. Get up. Get up. And press on. How many times? Jesus once said, if your neighbor offends you, and ask for forgiveness. He was asked, how many times must I forgive, Lord? Remember what Jesus said? Now, I want you to listen to this really good. Boy, when this one hit me in the fullness of its meaning, it really helped me. Jesus said 70 times 7. You know, the disciples said 7 times, Lord? No, I tell you, 70 times 7. Now, now that's the biblical reference for an infinite number of times. Now, Jesus is telling us we must forgive each other an infinite number of times. Not just seven times, 70 times seven. 
As many times as you repent, forgive. You know what? I know something. Jesus practices what he preaches. He will forgive me. I am not to be presumptuous. I fall on my face. I get up. It's the devil who says to you, oh, you see, you're no good. You'll never be any good. You'll never be anything other than a miserable sinner. That's the devil talking. But Jesus is the merciful one. Come to me. All you who labor. And so, over and over and over and over again, we plan, we prepare, we practice our battle drills, as they say in the military. Mom and Dad, you must get discouraged sometimes. This is a rough world to bring children up in. And, and I can imagine that, that at times you would be somewhat, you know, that's a daunting task. You'd be maybe even frightened. I would be. You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. Just be prepared. Start young. You know, there's maybe some young couples in here. Maybe there's a, there's a lady in here who, who might be pregnant. You know, you, you brought the baby to this nice dinner tonight. That's good. That's a good start. You know, bring them to church, too. You know, and pray together. Because all of that, the babe in the womb absorbs. Mark my words. Prepare. Prepare that soldier. Hmm? Prepare. Plan. Practice. And don't ever get discouraged. Leadership. We are called to be leaders in Jesus Christ. L, lead by example. Educate. Attitude. Discipline. Empower. Receive and respect input. Sacrifice. Humility. Initiative. Plan, prepare, and practice. If you do this assiduously, really work on it. Pray for the grace to do it. You will be a true leader, and you will make a difference. Whether you're 8 or 80, you'll make a difference. I remember a day when I was 8, thereabouts. I alluded to it earlier. For some odd reason when I was young, used to be a show on when I was young about West Point. Some of you are old enough, you probably remember it. It was a story that revolved around the life of the cadets at West Point. And I was enamored of that. And I truly wanted to go to West Point. And um, I told my, my parents and my grandfather, who was an old sergeant in the Army in World War I, was very, he loved the Army. He took me to West Point. He brought me down there. And we walked around, and I saw him go. There were some, some men standing around in suits. And we were up on the cliffs overlooking the Hudson River. West Point is on a, built up on a bluff overlooking the Hudson River, the United States Military Academy. And it was just one of all the, the, the uh, monuments there and the old cannons, and the, the cadets were in formation. There was a, there was a football game that weekend, and all, it, it was just a, an atmosphere that was just unbelievable. And there was these men in suits around, and, and I saw my grandfather talking to one of them. And um, so we, we walked out uh, on the bluff, and we were looking out at the, at the river, and my grandfather said, go over there and say hello to that man over there. I said, I don't know him, Grandpa. I said, that's okay. Just go say hello to him. So I walked over to this older man who was standing looking out over the river. And I said, hello, sir. And he looked down at me and smiled. And he's kind of familiar, but I didn't really know who he was. And he said, what's your name? And I told him. And he, he said, well, what brings you to West Point? I said, oh, I love West Point. I want to come here someday. And he looked at me, and I could see almost tears came in his eyes. And he said, well, you know, West Point trains leaders. I said, yes, sir, I know. He said, you want to be a leader? I said, well, yes, sir. 
and he smiled and he said, remember that if you're a leader, there will be a loneliness in command and you will have to do hard things and you will have to have principles and you should always put God first in order to be a leader. And he smiled at me and I said, yes, sir. And I went back and my grandfather took my hand and we walked out and I, I said, who was that man, Grandpa? And my grandfather said, that's the President of the United States, General Dwight D. Eisenhower. And he knew something about leadership. My brothers and sisters, we are called to the highest form of leadership there is, spiritual leadership in Jesus Christ. Never falter, never look back, live it, live it. You will be a leader and in the end you will lead others to heaven. That's what it's all about. God bless you.